Hi, it's Miss Sarah. Welcome to week two of Chip Away at a Chapter Book. This week's book is called Help! I'm a Prisoner in the Library. We're going to read chapters one and two today. Are you excited? I am too. Here we go. First chapter is called Last Minute Harry. The whole thing was really Mr. One Tree's fault. At least, that's what Mary Rose thought. It began because her father didn't stop for gas in time. The needle pointed to empty. Mary Rose called Mr. One Tree's attention to the fact each time they passed a gas station. I've told you a hundred times, Mr. One Tree said. I can still go another ten or fifteen miles easily. There was no use trying to talk to her father, Mary Rose knew. Mr. One Tree never took care of anything until the very last minute. When it came time to pay his taxes, he stood in line at the post office to get his letter mail just before the midnight deadline. When he had to get a new license plate, he always wound up on the last day of the month at the end of the line that went around the block. Mrs. One Tree called him last minute Harry. Mr. One Tree had waited till the last minute to take Mary Rose and her sister Jo Beth, who was asleep on the back seat of the car, to stay with Aunt Madge. It's beginning to snow, Miss One Tree had warned her husband. I'd like to see Mary Rose and Joe Beth settled in with Madge before I go to the hospital. Before Mr. One Tree could answer, she went on. I'm the one who's having the baby, Harry, so don't tell me there's lots of time. I don't see why we need another baby around here, Joe Beth had said. I think two girls in the family are plenty. Joe Beth had liked the idea of going to visit Aunt Madge, who had just moved to Indianapolis, but she didn't think she should be pushed out of her own house because a new baby was coming. It would probably be a boy anyway, because that's what her father kept hoping it would be, and then there would be a lot of fuss over it. Wait and see, she told Mary Rose darkly. You'll probably have a boy, Joe Beth had said, getting what her mother called that gloomy Gus look on her face. <clears throat> And we'll probably all be standing here till doomsday, Mrs. One Tree had answered impatiently, trying to push her family out the door. I'll drop them off and come right back, Mr. One Tree had promised. As soon as I can, anyway. I figure a good two hours there and another two hours back. You're not going to speed. Mary Rose, make sure your father doesn't speed. And you watch that gas gauge, too. When it's down to a quarter of a tank, you remind your father to stop at a gas station. Don't let him wait until the last minute. I know I can depend on you, Mary Rose, her mother had said. So Mary Rose had watched the gauge, and she had reminded her father when the needle moved down below the quarter tank mark. But it hadn't helped. And now here they were, pulled over to the curb on some strange corner in Indianapolis. Mary Rose was surprised the car hadn't stopped dead right in the middle of the street. Joe Beth woke up. Are we there yet? She rubbed the car window. I can't see out. Why are we just sitting here? We're out of ga gas, Mary Rose said in her best I told you so voice. And it's snowing harder. You girls sit tight, Mr. One Tree started to jump out of the car. I'm going to get the gas can from the trunk and jog over to that gas station we passed a few blocks back. Remember, stay in the car and keep the doors locked. I'll be back in a couple minutes. We'll freeze, Joe Beth said with satisfaction. The snow will come down and cover the car and we'll freeze to death while you're gone. Mr. One Tree shook his head. How could two sisters be so different? They looked very much alike with their fine straight brown hair and dark brown eyes and their bright smiles, except that Joe Beth's smile showed a tooth missing in the front. Mary Rose was a practical-minded girl, responsible. That's what Mary Rose was. Joe Beth, on the other hand, made a big deal out of everything. She could dramatize the smallest happening. Freeze to death! Mr. One Tree shook his head again. Cover yourself with the blanket if you get cold. And remember, keep the doors locked. The minute Mr. One Tree was out of sight, Joe Beth announced, I have to go to the bathroom. Why didn't you say something before? You could have gone to the gas station with Daddy. I didn't have to go then. I have to go now, 
Joe Beth added. It's an emergency. You're just like Daddy. Everything at the last minute. You'll just have to hold it. I can't hold back. It's an emergency, Mary Rose. Mary Rose sighed. Well, maybe someone will let us in someplace. Come on. The two girls got out of the car. Mary Rose squinted her eyes half closed to keep the snow and the rising wind from cutting off her vision. There's a building down the street. They probably have a bathroom. Come on, Joe Beth. Walk fast. It's cold. The snow was settling. Walking was a struggle. Joe Beth held her head down because the wind was nipping at her cheeks and nose. Mary Rose kept staring ahead so she could see how much further they had to go. So it was Mary Rose who spotted the sign in front of a whole, huge old house not far from the corner. The sign read, The Fenton Memorial Library for Children. Hours, 9 to 5 daily. Mary Rose pushed her sleeve back so she could see her watch. It would be 5 o'clock in about 5 minutes. Quick, Joe Beth, she shouted at her sister. We can go in here. It's a library. They always have a bathroom in the library. The girls hurried up the steps, which led around a wide stone porch that seemed to wrap itself around the front and sides of the house. Set back on the porch were two wide doors. The lower half of the doors was made of light and dark pieces of wood, so they set so they formed a diamond pattern. Smaller pieces of wood in the same design held large glass panels in place of the upper half of the doors. The glass seemed to have waves in it, like small ripples in a pond. When Mary Rose pushed the door open, the girls found themselves standing in the entryway. Oh, at least it's warm in here, Joe Beth said, brushing the snow from her jacket and jeans. Look at this floor! I never saw one like this before, said Mary Rose. The floor was made of mosaic, soft colored blue and gray chips of stone that had been laid in place by hand, piece by piece. It has pictures in it. Jo Beth didn't care about the pictures in a floor. She was busy opening another door in the entry. Like the front door, this too was half wood and half glass. This isn't a library, Jo Beth said. This is somebody's house. No, it isn't. Look at all the books. There were books everywhere, on shelves, on tables, on carts, and on a large desk, which Mary Rose guessed must belong to the librarian. The room the girls were standing in was quite large. Mary Rose had to lean her head way back to see the high decorated ceiling. The rich brown wood walls glowed in the light of an enormous crystal chandelier hanging in the center of the room. The chandelier had tiny glass droplets that made a slight tinkling sound caused by the breeze that had whistled in when the girls opened the front door. They could see other rooms through a number of arched doorways. To the right, toward the back of the house, a wide, handsome stairway turned and twisted to an upper floor. The steps were covered with dark red carpeting. Across the bottom step, stretching from one banister to another, was a black velvet twisted rope. In the middle of the rope was a sign with the words, Private. No admittance to the public. It was very, very quiet. There was no one in the room, not even a librarian. Where is everybody? Joe Beth asked in a hushed voice. Who'd come out in this kind of weather to go to the library? Mary Rose demanded, except us, because of you and your emergencies. But where's the librarian? Joe Beth insisted. She's probably looking in all the rooms to make sure everyone's gone home before she locks up and she goes home, Mary Rose explained. She looked around. It sure is different. Hey, Joe Beth, look back there. That looks like some funny old kind of wagon in the back room with people sitting in it. Mary Rose sounded excited. Come on, let's go see what it is. Joe Beth wasn't interested. When Mary Rose mentioned the emergency, she suddenly remembered why they were there. She caught sight of the sign that said, Restroom. An arrow pointed to the back of the house. I really have to go, Joe Beth warned. As Mary Rose walked to the back with her sister, she thought, I wish we had time to see if that wagon, 
if that really is a wagon with people in it. I wish we had lots and lots of time to stay here. I'll bet there's all kind of interesting things to see in those other rooms. You crossed your fingers and closed your eyes. You made a wish, Joe Beth said knowingly as she rushed into the restroom. Mary Rose followed her sister with dragging steps. Maybe I can take a quick look on the way out, she told herself. Just one quick look before the librarian makes us leave. Chapter 2. The Spooky Blue Lights Mary Rose made a quick decision. I have to see that wagon, she told her sister. Meet me in, the ba in that back room. Without waiting for a reply, she ran off. When Joe Beth finally joined her, Mary Rose had already examined the display. It's a school bus, she explained, from long ago. Only then it was called a kid hack. A what? A kid hack. And those big dolls sitting up there are dressed just the way the kids dressed in olden times. They look more like the store dummies you see in windows. Look at the way they're arranged, Mary Rose. Two of the dolls appeared to be leaning slightly out of the wagon, as if they were watching the road. Two had their heads turned toward each other. They almost seemed to be having a conversation. Three sat one behind another, their eyes straight ahead. What does the sign say? Joe Beth asked eagerly. Her sister read it aloud. Early school buses were called kid hacks. They were ordinary wagons covered with either sailcloth or canvas. The students being taken to and from school sat on hard wooden benches. In bad weather, sailcloth curtains were dropped to protect the children from rain or snow or wind. In winter, the wagons were heated by small stoves in which coal or wood or even corn cobs were burned. Sometimes the stove was fastened in place under the floor of the kid hack. In some wagons, the small black stove was placed inside. Later models were much fancier. Rubber tires replaced the wooden wheels. Real glass windows were used instead of cloth curtains. Some kid hacks even boasted carpeting on the floor and lap robes to keep the children comfortable against the wintry blasts. As Mary Rose read, Joe Beth went around to the back of the display. Now she called, There's a little stove in the wagon and more old clothes on a bench. Mary Rose went behind the display too. She picked up some dry corn cobs from the wagon floor and put them in the clawfoot little iron stove while Joe Bell Beth held a dress against herself wondering if it would fit. Neither of the girls heard the librarian moving about, and Vilmore Fenton, the librarian, didn't realize anyone else was in the library. No one had come after it begun to snow. Miss Fenton had almost decided to close up early, but the sign outside listed the hours as 9 to 5 daily. Miss Fenton was a woman who believed in carrying out her duties. There were ten rooms downstairs. Grandfather Fenton had always said that when he built the house, he built it big. And Miss Fenton had been going from room to room. She did this each evening at closing time to make sure everyone was out of the building. She had looked into the restroom. Now she went to the room with the kid hack display. She often found children lingering here. She didn't bother to go into the room, just stood at the doorway and glanced inside quickly. Both girls were hidden from her view by the kid hack, and since Mary Rose and Joe Beth had stopped talking for the moment, Miss Fenton didn't hear anything. Satisfied, she walked away and headed for the outside front doors. Just as she was about to lock them, a man rapped sharply on the window. Miss Fenton opened the door to the merest crack, but even so, so snow began to whirl in. Yes, what is it? Miss Fenton asked impatiently. Excuse me, are there two little girls in here by any chance? One is ten and the other is seven. The library is closed. They might be in the bathroom, the man pleaded. Please, will you just let me come in and look? Miss Fenton had read many stories in the newspapers about people who came to one's door and asked to use the phone or made up excuses about accidents or whatever. Once inside, they attacked anyone foolish enough to let them in. 
Miss Fenton lived alone and liked it, and she wasn't afraid of staying in this big old house by herself. Just the same, she wasn't going to let this man put one foot inside the door. To begin with, Miss Fenton had already checked the bathroom and the other rooms downstairs. She knew the building was empty, except for herself, of course. Furthermore, the man's eyes were wild. He was breathing hard, and his voice was shaky. There are no children here, Miss Fenton insisted, and she closed the door firmly in Mr. Wontree's face. Then she locked and bolted the door and did the same with the inner doors. Miss Fenton didn't believe in taking unnecessary chances. The double locked doors, both inside and out, could be opened only with her keys. Going back to the stairway, she stepped over the side and walked briskly up the steps. Miss Fenton did everything briskly. She was about medium height. Her lively black eyes exactly matched her black hair, which was short and thick and bristled up from her head like a fur on an angry cat. Her hands seemed almost too large for her body, but Miss Fenton was proud of them. They were good, strong hands, and they served her very well. At the top of the landing, Miss Fenton took one last look at the floor below. Then she turned and went up another stairway that led to the third floor. Miss Fenton always checked the windows upstairs to make sure they were locked. Satisfied that all was well, she went down again to the second floor, where she pressed a switch that turned off the big bright lights below. She pressed another switch that turned on small dim blue lights in each of the rooms downstairs and on the landing. When the lights went out so suddenly, the two girls were so shocked they couldn't speak. Joe Beth gave a small gasp. Mary Rose realized two things almost at once. They had forgotten about the time, and they had forgotten about their father, who must have come back to the car with a gasp by now. The librarian's gone home. I bet she's locked us in, Mary Rose nodded her head. And Daddy doesn't even know where we are, and all because of you and your last-minute emergencies. She glared at her sister. See what you've gone and done to us? Me? Me? Who wanted to come in and take a look at this old wagon? Who was the one that made the secret wish? Joe Beth shivered. I don't like these spooky blue lights. They make everything so weird. Mary Rose agreed. The big dolls in their strange clothes suddenly made her feel uneasy. Were the dolls moving? Weren't they getting bigger? Mary Rose felt scared. This was exactly the way she had felt the time her father had taken them to the wax museum. They're creepy, Joe Beth whispered, almost if, if, as if she could read her sister's mind. The way they keep staring, it's like they see something we can't. I hate these blue lights. Even Mary Rose's face was beginning to look spooky in the dim colored room. I'm getting out of here. Jo Beth dropped the dress she had been holding when the lights went out. She wanted to run, but it was hard to see where she was going. She came out from behind the display and crept along to the front door, with Mary Rose right behind her. At the door, she pulled and tugged at the knob. What good is that? The doors are locked. There she goes again, Miss Know-It-All, Jo Beth thought irritated. She could see now that there was no use in trying to get the doors open but it made her feel as if she was doing something. I know they're locked, she snapped. I thought maybe I could loosen them up or something. She was so angry she kicked the door. Whoever heard of locking the door inside with a key? Maybe she has a lot of valuable things here. I'd do the same if I had something valuable, Mary Rose said thoughtfully. Jo Beth turned and stood with her back up against the door. The blue lights were even worse in here because the room was so big. Shadows crouched down from the walls and moved closer and closer. Jo Beth swallowed hard, but the hollow sensation in her stomach refused to go away. Outside, the wind was tearing at the house, moaning and screaming, trying to get inside. Jo Beth was sure the wind was calling her name in a long, drawn-out shriek. Jo Beth! Jo Beth! She couldn't stand it anymore. Oh, Mary Rose, she sobbed. We're never going to get out of here. The librarian's gone and Daddy doesn't know where we are. 
Suppose it storms for days and days. We'll starve. They'll find our poor starved bodies. Joe Beth became so interested in what she was saying that she stopped crying. Wouldn't everybody be sad? And the new baby would never know what wonderful sisters he had had, especially Joe Beth. No wonder Mommy calls you gloomy Gus, said Mary Rose. You're so silly. She started to walk away from the door. Joe Beth promptly followed. I don't want to stay here by myself. Where are you going? I'm going to find the phone, dummy. You said at least one sensible thing. Nobody knows we're here. So I guess it would be a good idea to call somebody on the phone and tell them that we are. That's the end of chapters one and two in Help! I'm a prisoner in the library. Tune in tomorrow for the next two chapters. See you soon.